So good morning. It's good to see everybody today. I hope you've had a good week. Um, you know, sometimes we get here on Sunday morning and you have one of those mornings where everything just falls into place. You know, you know what I mean? Everything's going great and you can just tell that, I mean, it's just going to be a great morning. Uh, this morning was not one of those mornings. <laughs> Okay, that, that, I'm just telling you up front, I mean, it's like this morning has been crazy, but here's, the longer I've been in ministry, here's what I've learned, right? It's on mornings like that, right, when Satan is trying to thwart every single thing you do. I think it's on mornings like that where God is about to do something big. I think it's mornings like that where God is saying, okay, we need to listen up because what uh, God has to speak into our hearts today is important. I think that's when Satan attacks. And so when technology doesn't work right and things don't, you know, all that stuff, you kind of, you just know uh, that it's going to be a good morning in my opinion. And so I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad uh, we can continue our series going through the book of 1 John. Um, have you guys ever noticed, um, have you, and maybe you've seen some magazines like this, that uh, they're normal magazines, but when you get to the back, they're full of ads. You know what I'm talking about? The, the magazine's full of ads, and you get those ads, you're like, the only reason I ever look at them is to laugh, all right? They're the type of ads that you like, you know, if, if you buy this spray and spray it on you, it will attract people from the opposite sex and they, you will be irresistible. Or uh, there are ads that say you can work from home and uh, for 30 minutes uh, a week and make $5,000 a week. You know, you know, have you seen those ads like that? And they're just absolutely crazy stuff. And, I mean, I was thinking one day, why in the world do people pay to put ads like that in a magazine? And then it hit me. They're in there because people actually buy that stuff, right? And it's crazy to me that anybody would fall for that. I'm sitting there just laughing at it, thinking, how in the world is this even semi-believable and yet, I know people are falling for it day after day. They're making money enough on it to pay for advertising. And, and it just kind of makes me realize, right, um, that we lack a little bit of discernment in our culture today. The same thing with telemarketer calls. How many of you have got those calls that say, stop what you're doing? Have you got those calls? All right. Again, why do they make them? Because someone is stupid enough to sit there and listen to the whole thing and say, wow, sign me up. And, and, and they wouldn't do it if they're not making money on it. Okay? Again, we live in a culture that lacks discernment. And, and, and I just really this morning, I think the passage we're about to talk about and get into, it's all about discernment. It's all about being able to tell uh, the difference between what is truth and what is not. And, and for many of us, it's not just the telemarketers. It's not just the, the ads that we struggle with. It's not just Facebook. It's not just the news. It's spiritual matters as well. It's knowing the difference between, oh man, this is right. This is biblical, right? This, this is what, this is all about Jesus versus this is just some, some semi-spirituality, sounds good, feels good stuff that, that's not really, that doesn't really have the power to change your life. And, and so I, this morning, I just want to open up with a, a really basic definition of discernment. Because that's a biblical word you hear a lot. You need to have discernment. You need to be able to discern. Well, what do we mean when we say that word? Well, here's the definition that's in, the, in your notes. Discernment is the ability to decide between truth and error. Okay? That, that at its basic form, that's what discernment is. Someone that has good discernment, uh, when they hear something that's false, when they hear something that's not true, they recognize it, right? And they're able to, to hear it and say, oh, that's not right. Um, they, they have that, that, that ability to kind of sense out when someone is telling a, a lie. Uh, someone that lacks discernment, is the type of person that is buying from the back of magazine ads, that's listening to the telemarketers and saying, oh yeah, I want to I do that. Um, that's always clicking on Facebook on those, 
links that you know spam everybody else in your friend list. It, that's people that lack discernment um, struggle with being able to, de- to determine the difference between truth and error. And so in this room, there will be people kind of, some of you are strong in discernment, some of you are weak in discernment. But all of us can grow in our discernment, and all of us need to get a little better. 1 Thessalonians 5 says that we need to examine everything carefully. And that speaks of testing something to, to be able to determine whether it's genuine or not. And so as believers, we've got to evaluate everything we come into contact with to distinguish what is true and false, what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. And that's not always easy. Because one one of the reasons it's not easy is because we have, we're fighting the desires of our flesh. You know, we want to, we want to think about ourselves and we want to get ahead and we want, uh, we're just constantly battling those sinful desires. But we also face what I would call satanic deception. And and, and what I mean by that is Satan is constantly trying to to deceive us and and pull us away from the truth. And and so he's constantly telling us, did God really say that? Is that really what God meant? Is that really what you believe? Those voices inside your head, that's satanic deception. And so we're, we're fighting that. And then... The, the third thing, we're, we're kind of inundated with all these worldly influences. Well, everyone else is doing it, and so that must mean it's true. That must mean it's okay. That must mean there's nothing wrong with it. And, and so kind of when you add up all of those things, right, the, the sinful desires and the satanic deception and the worldly influences, this is why uh, discernment is, is such a, almost a, a lost art in our culture today. This is why people struggle with discernment so much. Uh, I mentioned earlier Facebook. Just think about that. Think about how much um, we we live in this society now that we have access to so much information that people aren't able to to tell what is true and what is not. Right? Um, The whole idea of, you know, hoax stories and, and satire sites and fake news and all this stuff that's out there. It's like when we get online, how do we know that what we're reading is right? Well, you don't. You, you, you don't. I mean, even like if you're in, you know, in education, um, uh, you know, one of the biggest encyclopedia sites now is Wikipedia, right? But the problem with Wikipedia is anybody can go in and change it. So even when you're on an encyclopedia site, you can't trust what you're reading. And the reality is, right, we live in this world where we have got to have good, and not just good, we've got to have great discernment if we want to be effective as believers, and, and, and you, you look at all the hoaxes out there, you look at the email viruses, click on this link. I mean, again, we've got to be able to, 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 to tell a difference. But it goes beyond that and it goes to spirituality and all the different twistings of, of what the gospel really is and the cults that are out there. So, so here's what I want to do. I, I want to jump into scripture this morning and read a passage that was uh, written to a church that was struggling with knowing what to believe, what's true and what's not. And, and so in this church, John wrote to them, um, and he's telling them, you've got all these false teachers coming in, telling you different stuff. You need to be able to tell what is truth and what is not. And so uh, I, I want to do two things this morning, and, and two things that um, I want to share with you. How can we know that someone is speaking truth? How can we know? The first thing is that we've got to examine what they say. We've got to listen carefully. We've got to look at what they say and compare it to the words of God to say, okay, does this line up? Is this true? And so if we jump into 1 John, we're in chapter 4 now. If you've got your Bibles, you can flip there with me. 1 John chapter 4, um, and we'll pick it up right in verse 1. It says, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. 
You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if we have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the Spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. And so, again, going back, let's go back to to the first century here. Uh, John specifically warns us that we cannot believe everything we're told. In their church, they had people coming in and say, Jesus wasn't real. He he was just a spirit. Uh, He he really didn't come in the flesh. And and y'all just made all that up. And John's like, no, I was there. I saw him, I touched him, I ate with him, I I walked along the road with him, I spent time with him. He was real. And so he's this black and white here. If you say that he didn't really come in the flesh, if you say he isn't really real, that he's just a spirit or a phantom or a figment of our imagination, then you're not from God. there's 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 no wiggle room here, right? You either believe that Jesus truly is God and is God in the flesh, or you're not from God. And that's really what he's telling them in this church here, because they had people coming in, they were talking spiritually, it sounded good, like, oh, that's interesting, oh yeah, I've never thought of that, maybe that is true. And they they were listening without discerning. They were listening and, and, and hearing all this stuff and saying, oh, yeah, that, that sounds good. I, I, yeah, sure. I, I can go along with that. And, and so he's telling them they have to be on guard. And if people claim, uh, you know, people claim then to have the authority to teach on spiritual issues, and, and so they just let them talk. And, and he's saying, wait a minute, you've got to have them prove it. You've got to test Right? You've got to test them to see if the spirit they have, if it comes from God. And so when we hear stuff, when we hear anything spiritual, when we hear anything Jesus-related, it's like automatically we need to go into a little bit of a, 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 a cautious mode. Okay, let, let's test what they're saying. Is what I'm hearing, is it right? Is it true? Does it line up with what Scripture says? And so I'm not trying to make everyone cynical, but I am trying to make you aware, right? We've got to be aware that there's so many people out there teaching things that go against the Word of God. Uh, Unfortunately, TV is one of the the biggest places you see that. Um, And and the way you can tell a lot just by how, uh, by, by just testing what they say against Scripture. And so you, you start looking at their content. Does their message encourage God's people to worship, to obey Him? Or does it lead you into idolatry, to worship things that are not God? Uh, what, what a person says is far more important than how he says it. And again, I think in our culture, we've kind of elevated how you say it above what you say. And so the popular speakers and, and worship leaders and everybody else are, are the, the people who just, man, they, you listen to them and say, man, they're incredible. And did you hear what they say? And, and they're so charismatic and you, you're just drawn to them. But then you look at what they say and it doesn't always line up. And so that's why we've got to be careful That's why we've got to be cautious. There's this plumb line that God has revealed truth in the Scriptures, and and, and and it's it's either right or it's not. And so we've got to be able to evaluate everything compared to Scripture. We all have that responsibility. And I think sometimes we think, well, that's what the pastor is supposed to do. That's what the elders are there for. And, And there is truth to that because the elders... And one of their roles in Scripture, as we read, is to protect the flock um, from false teaching. But it goes beyond that because every single believer has to be able to do this. And, and so, uh, you know, he, he gives us a, a really a practical outline. This is how we know if that person has the Spirit of God. If they 
claim that, that Jesus came in a real body, and that was the issue of the day. But what he's really saying is, do you have the right belief about Jesus? Do you have the right belief about who Jesus is and why he came? And if you do, right, th then that's important. And that's why there's so many uh, cults and, um, and really cults is the best word for them that are out there that, that, that kind of deny the deity of Jesus. And, and although they may use the Bible and, and say they go by the Bible, it's a big deal when they get Jesus wrong. That's why we've got to be aware. We've got to be uh, 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 on watch for that. Um, in, in, in Acts 17, he talks about the Bereans who were the noble Christians because when they heard a message, they didn't automatic, automatically believe it. They went to the Scripture to compare what they heard to what was in the Word so that they, so that they knew they could believe it or not. And that's what we should be like. And so our problem today, though, um, is that people just don't know their Bible well enough to know if what they're hearing is true. I really think that's probably, if you want to get down to the heart of the matter, I think this is probably the biggest challenge we face today. Because people, their beliefs about the Bible, their beliefs about Jesus, their beliefs about God, are influenced more by pop culture instead of what the Word of God says. And so when you hear something that sounds good, that sounds encouraging, that sounds uplifting, you're like, oh yeah, that's good. And we don't always compare it back to what God actually says. There's a story about George Whitfield. He was a great British evangelist that traveled throughout the United States and years ago. And he was speaking to a man about his soul. And so he asked this man, sir, what do you believe? And the man replied, I believe what my church believes. And so he asked then, so what does your church believe? Well, he said, well, the same thing I believe. And so he said, and what do you both of you believe? The preacher inquired again. And he said, we both believe the same thing. And that's the only reply he could get. And I have a feeling, right? And not to be mean, but I have a feeling that many people, even in this room, if you were really pinned down and say what you believe, they were like, I just believe what they teach in church. Well, what they teach in church? Well, it's what I believe. Well, and we get in this circular reasoning, right? Because we don't really know, we don't really open up the Bible enough, we don't read, we're not studying enough to actually know what we believe and why we believe it. And, those, and when we get in that spot, it's so easy to be deceived. It's so easy to hear something and say, oh, I like that. I'm going to believe that now. And not even take the time to compare it back to the Bible. What is the basis for what we believe? For most people, it's not the Word. It's their feelings. And again, I think this is part of a symptom of, of uh, this, this postmodern world we live in is that we want to go by what we feel is right and what sounds good and what feels good instead of what God really says. Um, it's, it's really the current of culture that's sweeping us away from biblical truth. Uh, if you study denominations, you study things like that in our world today, uh, you would know that a lot of our mainline denominations, denominations that were strong for, for centuries, have really left, uh, left, uh, uh, kind of fallen away from, from trusting what the Bible actually says. Uh, they are, are denying the authority of Scripture, uh, lots of things that are going on. Um, and this is not all denominations, just, uh, you know, I'm not going to call names, but a lot of things are going on in our world today where they say, well, the Bible says this, but we can't really believe what the Bible says, and we want to go by this instead because this is what we think Jesus was really like. And so that's the type of thinking that's happened, and it, they've lost their anchor in Scripture. And so what's happened now that their anchor's gone, they're just being swept downstream in this current of culture. And I think 
what happened, they threw out the scripture so that they could do good things. Uh, and, and it sounds good on the surface. They say we don't really believe and trust the Bible, but we want to be like Jesus. And here's the problem. If you don't have a correct understanding of who Jesus really is and who he was, all right, then you're not going to be able to live like him. And our, the, the, the picture we have of scripture is uh, the picture of, the, of who Jesus really is. So you, you can't throw out one and keep the other. And so uh, we know God is love. We know that he wants us to meet needs. We talked about that last week. And that's all true. But the gospel first meets our spiritual needs so that we can then go out and make disciples and serve one another in love. And, and so uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of the, the, the issue that we get to. And so when we get to the, the place where we start questioning what the Bible says, it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. And I go back to, 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 to Genesis when, when Satan told Adam and Eve, did, did God really say that? Because I think that's the same argument Satan is using against us today. And so let's talk about some of the ways. Let, if we're going to examine uh, what people say well, what are the things we need to be on guard about? One of the things is what do people say about Jesus? If we're hearing somebody preach or teach, uh, or someone is trying to share with you their spiritual beliefs, we've got to listen carefully to what they say about Jesus. Um, and and this, this was kind of the main problem that John was addressing. I, I heard one pastor say it this way. He said, Jesus is God's selfie. <laughs> Kind of a unique way to think about it. But it's the perfect picture of who God is, right? It's the image of God. We see that in John chapter 1. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it's how God was revealed to man. If we, keep, if we skip ahead in 1 John chapter 4 to verse 9, um, and this is a recurring theme. We've talked about this a lot throughout this series. Um, is God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and His only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. And this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and that He sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Um, and so right there, we, we see that, that you know, why, why did Jesus come? Here's the gospel message right here. So that we might have eternal life, so that he could take away our sins, so that we could be restored and have a relationship with the God who created us. This is the gospel. Uh, and any time that you, you take that out and you twist that and you make Jesus into to someone else or something else or he's just a good moral teacher, he's just a, a prophet or he, he just a, a God created him or he's just a spirit or whatever you throw out there, we've got to be on guard to say, no, this is who Jesus really was. He says in 1 John 4.15, All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God, you have God living in in them and they live in God and so what we believe about Jesus we've got to get that right and if you go back a few weeks ago here and look at this sermon series you'll see we did a whole sermon just on that very topic but not only that we have to evaluate not what they say about Jesus but another common area of false teaching today is what people believe about end times what people believe about end times and what I mean by that uh, it's kind of, you see trends come and go, and so one of the trends that was really popular even a couple of years ago is denying the existence of hell. Saying, oh, uh, you know, in the end, uh, everybody's going to be all right. God's going to save everybody. It's all going to work out. Uh, there, hell, don't worry about that. Uh, you don't have to worry about hell or any of that stuff. It, God's going to work everything out just just, just live your life however. I mean, that was kind of, that's kind of been a popular, popular belief, even within churches, um, that, that, that you don't really have to, to believe in hell. There's no such thing as eternal punishment. And that bothers me because when we look at Scripture, uh, especially in this book of 1 John, he is very clear. You either know Jesus or you don't. Right? There's no, there, there, there's consequences to sin. The consequence of sin is death. It's separation from God for all of eternity. It's hell. 
And, and so we can't gloss over that and say, oh, we don't like that concept. It makes me uncomfortable. I need my safe sp space. <laughs> We've got to be able to look at it and say, this is real. This is serious. This is urgent. This is why we share the gospel. This is why we live it out. And, and so uh, we can't, you know, when it comes to end times, we have to realize that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And the choice we make here on earth determines which one we will spend all eternity in. And, and if we keep going in, in chapter 4 here, it says, God is love, and all who live in God uh, who live and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. All right? But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love it has no fear because perfect love it expels all fear. If we are afraid, it's for the fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. We love each other because He first loved us. And so here in 1 John, He's just telling us what we believe about the judgment makes a difference. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to live our life in fear. I just hope, I just hope I'm going to get in. I mean, I think that's how so many people are living. They're like... I'm just trying to be a really good person, so maybe when I die, Jesus will let me into heaven. And, and if, you, if that's what you believe, you've missed the point of the gospel. It's not about what you do, it's about what Jesus did for you. And our lives are a response to that. We love, we love God, we love others because He first loved us. He demonstrated that for us. So this whole idea about end times, it's important. Another area that people mess up uh, a lot in our culture today, and I think this is probably the biggest false teaching we see, is the area of money. And, and, I, and, and I've talked about this from time to time over the years. I've never really done a full sermon on it or, or got into it deep, but the, there's a whole thing called that, it's called different things, prosperity gospel, the health and wealth, the name it and claim it, uh, the word of faith movement. All these are kind of under this umbrella of this whole gospel uh, that's been twisted. Um, and it promises Christians a healthy and a financially prosperous life if they are faithful. And so if you have faith, you're not going to be sick and you're going to be wealthy and you're, and you're going to have all these blessings given to you. And, and this is usually how it's taught is if you plant a seed by giving money to, to whoever you're listening to, then God is going to be faithful and He's going to give you back more than what you even gave. So if you want a new car, just give me your paycheck this week and God's going to give it back over and above and you're going to be blessed tenfold and you're going to get it. So you just name it, claim it, and you're going to get it back. And that sounds, I mean, when we hear that, can't we all agree that sounds ridiculous? That when we believe that God's the, like this vending machine, like he's like the, the lottery, we, put, we buy a scratch off and okay, he's, we're going to get it back, we're going to get it back. That's not how God works. In fact, over and over again throughout the New Testament, he tells us we're going to be persecuted. Not only that, we, if, if you look um, uh, and, and read about all the people and their great faith they have, and then you read about people who lost their life, who were martyred for what they believe, look at Hebrews 11. And just read that chapter and it starts off good and it ends with all these people who had great faith and yet, they were killed for what they believed. Right? We're not promised an easy life. We're not promised prosperity. We're not promised financial wealth. And the problem with this, when we distort the gospel, when we twist it, it preys on, on, it preys on people who have no money and who are looking for hope. Can I tell you that one of the greatest challenges that they're facing in Nicaragua right now when we go on our mission trips there and I've and I've done a lot of pastor training there and in Honduras and um, I've, I've been there multiple times and I hear it time after time is the prosperity gospel has taken root in Latin America and in Africa it, it, that's because they have nothing and this you, someone comes in and say hey if you give more you're going to get it back they're like okay I want to be I want to be faithful to God I'm going to give and the problem is the people who are asking for their monies are the ones 
who are living, living like these rich and luxurious lifestyles and the ones on TV have their private jets and their thousand dollar suits and uh, or, you know, th- million dollar mansions that they're living in. That's not the gospel. It's the fleecing of God's people because they don't know the truth, because they lack discernment. And, and so I, I would just, just challenge you. This is when the, the gospel is preached without the cross, without self sacrifice, without sin, without blood. Uh, when you don't preach on dying to self, when you talk about only talk about success and wealth and you can have it now and you deserve it, it's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel is we don't deserve anything, but yet we have eternal life because of grace and mercy. What we deserve is death. So, so this is this Satan is subtle. He doesn't just hit us with this full-on frontal attack. He kind of slips in and whispers and tells us what we want to hear. We want to hear, hey, you're going to be successful if you have faith. Uh, we don't want to think that, hey, there may be times in life where we suffer. We don't want to think about the times that Paul was thrown in prison or, or Joseph was in prison or, and, and people lost their life because of what they believed. But we have to know, right? That's what Scripture really teaches. Um, so how do we know if someone is speaking truth, we examine what they say. But there's a second aspect of it that I want to talk about this morning. And we also have to look at how they live. We have to look at how they live. Let's pick it up in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. It says, But you belong to God, my dear children. You've already won a victory over those people because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. How many have heard that verse before? Greater is He who is in you. Right here it is. The Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world. So they speak from the world's viewpoint and the world listens to them. But we belong to God and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. And so most of 1 John here is about identifying true Christians and false ones. And so this section is all about identifying true teachers and false teachers. I think verse 4 is one of the most popular, most famous verses, but it's not often, not often do you hear it in the context of this. Uh, this quote, this is quoted a lot to say, hey, the Holy Spirit is stronger than Satan. And while that's true, that's not exactly what it's saying here in context. It's saying that the genuine Christian has the stronger Holy Spirit in them, which means you can listen and you can follow the true gospel about Jesus because the Spirit is at work inside of us, helping us to, to it leads us to truth and it, it pulls us away from those false teachings. It helps us have discernment. Um, And so this is just, he's just kind of comforting his readers and easing their fears and saying, okay, you're not going to be tempted away from the truth because Jesus is greater. His truth is greater. And when you stand firm in it, the outcome is going to be far greater than, than listening to the lies of Satan. I think about the false teachers we deal with in our society today. And so when all they talk about is money, why are we surprised when they find corruption? Uh, it's interesting. Um, on Instagram, and, and my kids and I, we've had a lot of cool, funny discussions about this. There's a, 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 an account that started several months ago um, called Preachers and Sneakers. Has anybody heard about this? Okay, good. This is, this is fun. Um, and so it's got it's up to 195,000 followers so far. But this guy created a Instagram account, and what he's doing is posting pictures of preachers in their designer clothes and the d- designer sneakers. That's the thing now. It's like they try to wear these like really cool retro uh, shoes, right? 
Um, and so they're buying shoes that are like $600 or $1,000 or even three and $4,000 and Gucci coats and belt buckles. And it's the worship leaders and the pastors. And so this guy just started posting pictures of these pastors and these worship leaders and then posting beside of it how much what they're wearing actually cost. Interesting. That's why I said we've had some good discussions about it because does it re- do, should we really care what people wear? Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm wearing my sneakers today, but I'm not going to make it on that side, I promise you, okay? <laughs> they got a hole in them, I think, right here on the side. So, uh, the, the reality, right, I mean, this is crazy that that's, but it's a trend, it's what's trendy, it's what's cool, and it's funny how, like, people chase after that. And, and it just kind of, in some ways, I think it points out the hypocrisy, it points out the immaturity of following worldly trends to me. And, and I'm sure some of these people that have been kind of called out on, the, on this Instagram site, I'm sure they're good people. I'm sure they have good motives. But when you listen to the world and, and you try to be cool, this is what happens. You kind of lose focus on what's important. And I'm not just talking about young, cool, hip pastors too. I mean, there's the same side of things where pastors wearing five thousand dollar suits and you know fancy car i mean and i'm not saying that christians can't have nice things i think sometimes there's this poverty gospel you should that people tell you you should feel guilty if you have anything nice but i do think we have to be careful we we don't live in extravagance we've got to be content with what we have we've got to be able to 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 when God raises our, I love what Dave Ramsey says, when he, wait, when he raises our standard of, uh, of living, we raise our standard of giving, right? We've got to be able to, to do that. And, and so uh, it saddens me that we live in a culture that's so much about materialism, about pride, about greed, because those things, they're not from God. And, and so here... Um, you know, John, you, you think about who he's writing to in the first century. They've got these false teachers coming in. They're, they're telling them, the, the, you know, all this crazy stuff. And he's saying, look at their lives. Because you can tell a lot by someone by the fruit of how they live. And it's not just what they say. You look at the fruit of how they live. Because the fruit is really important. False religious systems, they may be popular, But a lot of the reasons they're popular is because they're appealing to what people really want, our fleshly desires. So the world listens to them because, hey, this I like this theology. I like what they're saying. I'm going to follow this. It kind of brings me to Matthew chapter 7. A a very familiar passage in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And I think this ties right in with what we're talking about this morning. It says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You you can identify them, right, by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. So again, you have to look at how they live. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce good bad fruit, and a bad tree can't can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. And then get then he kind of jumps in and he gets really serious here. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. These are people who are, are in church. These are people saying, I'm doing good things. I'm serving the poor. I'm helping others. I'm giving money. I'm going to church. And Jesus is going to tell them, depart from me because I never knew you. 
And so this gets back to, to the gospel. Anytime we take the gospel and we put a word in front of it, whether the prosperity gospel or the social gospel or whatever way we distort it, when the gospel becomes about anything other than Jesus, we have missed the gospel. The, the, the way we are saved is by grace through faith. Nothing else. It, it, it's, that's the gospel message. And everything else we do is a response to, to what Jesus has done in our life. And so, I just this whole message this morning, it's just about, do you really know Jesus? Do you really know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Him? In Acts chapter 20, another passage, it says, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day, and my many tears for you. And this is just Paul again reminding us, hey, there are going to be false teachers out there. What do you believe? I'm worried because we have so much access now to teaching from anywhere, at any time, and, and you throw that into a culture that lacks discernment, and it's a recipe, right, for people walking away from the faith. It's a recipe for people being misled. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing right now. Can I just tell you, just because it has a Christian label doesn't mean it's Christian. Just because you see it in a Christian bookstore doesn't mean it's Christian. Just because a preacher says it on TV doesn't mean it's Christian. We have to have discernment. We have to be able to know the difference between truth and lies. And so we have to have our Bibles open. We've got to read the Scripture. We have to learn the Scripture. When we come to church, we're encouraged. But don't just take what I say as the gospel truth until you open Scriptures and you find out for yourself. That's what we do as believers. Uh, we, we, really, we, we cannot tolerate any spirit of error. We've got to test the spirits. We've got to listen with the sermon. We've got to identify false teaching. We've got to identify false teachers. We've got to, to see what behind, what's behind what they're teaching and, and follow that's what, that is true and biblical and holy and right. And when we do that, I'm telling you, that's when you're going to experience a blessed life. Now, I'm not talking about financial blessings. I'm just talking about when you're doing the will of your Father, you're going to experience blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. And so this morning, I, I just want to just challenge you a little bit. How is your discernment? Are you able to tell the difference between what is truth and what is not? Are you struggling in that area? We're gonna, uh, I'm going to ask the, the guys to come back up and, and, and we're going to close out with the response time. But as we pray right now, I just want to take a minute to examine our hearts and, and let's, uh, let's talk to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, today as we come together, as we open your word, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would just reveal truth to us. I'm so thankful that you have left us with the Holy Spirit residing and living and dwelling inside of us that will reveal truth to us, that will help us learn what is holy and right, that will help us learn how we should live our lives in a way that pleases and honors you. So Heavenly Father, help us identify those false teachings that we are surrounded with in our culture today and whether it's just the, kind of the popular trends and fads of culture today, or whether it's someone that's drastically twisting the words of Jesus. Help us to know, Lord. Help us to be able to realize that. Heavenly Father, I pray for each person in this room, and, and if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus, would today be that day that they put their faith and their trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone to save them? Heavenly Father, we just thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.